Well, I'm actually going to start with a musical interlude to kind of like set my scene. So, welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning. This podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again to another episode of Keep It Fictional Book Chat from the Port Moody Public Library. So today's topic, I thought I would pick something that is hopefully my book friends feel that there's a little bit wider selection for them because, you know, you can pick any genre, any format, any kind of style, any subject you like, because all we need is a title with a color in it. So hopefully you have all found some books that have that because we have actually talked about quite a few on this show that has color in it. We have the girl in the purple skirt, I remember from Liz. We have the dark and deepest red from Sadie. I believe we have Black Flamingo. I think both Fiona, maybe both Corrine have also talked about it, maybe. Yeah. I remember talking about White Tears myself. And of course, I just have to mention it again. The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Kuhn. Sorry. <laughs> Last time of the year, I promise, maybe. I was preparing for this intro. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe we'll talk about colors and what they mean. But I'm actually going to swing it right over to Liz today because she has a book that I think will tell us all about colors. And then we can do our psychoanalysis afterwards. So Liz, what have you got for us today? Okay, no pressure there to introduce the topic. Um, but yes, it's true. I couldn't pick a book with just one color in it. So I decided to pick a book about all the colors. And this one is called The Secret Lives of Color. And it's by Kasia St. Clair. So yes, The Secret Lives of Color. What is that all about? It is in fact about all the colors, about what the colors mean and their history. So Kasia St. Clair started writing an article series for a British home design magazine. And of course, talking about design, she started talking a lot about color and the moods that it can evoke and how it can influence your feelings about a certain setting. And so she thought, these certain colors that I'm dealing with have stories behind them, then what about all of the rest of the colors and all the uh, different hues and the different shades, not to mention black and white? First, she starts with a lead off about color theory and how our human eyes detect color and how those visual cues are processed by our brains to be interpreted, rods and cones and all that scientific stuff. Then we get into the actual chapters about different colors. And what she does is she breaks everything down into the different, I guess, color families that we're familiar with. So all the various shades of white and then yellow progressing through our citrus colors and then going into purples, blues, greens, and browns. And with each chapter, which is relatively short, it's almost like a book of short factual stories about all of these colors, she'll pick particular aspects of historical instances of these colors and talk about why these shades had significance either in our present day or in history. So for example, if you look at Renaissance paintings and if you sort of strip away all the dirt and grime that has accumulated over the years and restore these paintings, then you'll notice a trend in the color palette of these Renaissance paintings. So all of these artists happen to paint with the same muted, very earthy, almost kind of murky tones. And so within this book, she explains why that came to be, how sometimes production and the use of certain materials such as lead influences cost and therefore influences what various artists and who they were commissioned by how it influenced what colors they actually chose and why certain colors of the time period overruled others, um, not to mention certain technologies not being yet available to produce some of the beautiful, vivid colors that we know today. 
So if you are interested in a nonfiction take on why we see the world around us as we do, why we take to certain colors more than others, why certain hues and shades have popularity and trends that have either stood the test of time or have fallen out of favor over the ages. I highly recommend The Secret Lives of Color by Kasia St. Clair. Thank you, Liz. A perfect introduction for the episode so that I don't have to do it. Excellent. Thank you for choosing that book, Liz. (laughs) All right. Tell me, Liz, what have you learned? I think you probably know our favorite colors. Maybe? Do we know our favorite colors? I mean, that's probably more of it. Maybe that's a better question. Yeah. I know your favorite color, Virginia. Yes. Everybody knows my color. (laughs) Dressing that. It's very themed for the day, but I mean, for every day. But what is, yeah, I'm curious. Do we all know what Israel's favorite color is? No. I know, I think Liz said blue at one point because we had an episode where we have books on blue color. And I remember her telling us about how she dressed all in blue one day and her mom was like, you're like a smurf today. But yeah, Sadie, what is your favorite color? I go back and forth. I I love purple. Um, I don't tend to wear a lot of it because for my, like my, my coloring, it purple is not the best color, uh, but I've always loved it. And then I really, really like teal as well. Any kind of shade and variation of teal all the way from like the super rich dark turquoise to like a lighter kind of lighter bluey kind of teal. Teal is a great color. I know it's weird because I don't like blue. I don't like green, but I like teal. I don't know what the deal is. Fiona. Red and green are my favorite colors. Uh, Not together. (laughs) Green is like my comfort color. Like if I everything could be green, I would just be like, feel like at ease and comfortable. But I also really like to wear yellow because it's so happy. I feel like that's part of the uh, the children's department uniform. Everybody has to have a yellow cardigan here. But Corrine. Like Sadie, there are colors that I wear more, mostly because my mom at one point was like, you look good in eggplant. And so <laughs> I had a lot of purple clothing growing up, but I don't necessarily love it. I'm trying to like think into my room, which I recently like bought stuff for. And I'm like, what color is it? It's like gray and pink and green. So I'm going to go with that aesthetic right now is what I'm enjoying. All right. And so now the list has read the book. She knows all about us. She can. Did anyone else have to take that uh, um, quiz in like grade school or like um, high school? And it was like you were like either green or blue or orange. And then the special people got to be gold. I, I did at my last job personality testing where you figured out what your color was. And their gold was just one of them, though. It wasn't like only certain people. It was just one of the classifications was gold. And then blue was another one. I remember blue, blue represents in like generally, obviously, however much you want to believe in these people who need like constant validation for their feelings. That's all I remember is that blue is like the people who, who like need to be told like I care about you I would not not in a bad way but just that that was one of the personality types Um, interesting thing to focus on like you know that is what your personality revolves around (laughs) we did a lot of personality testing at my last job (laughs) interesting Liz did you ever have to yeah the color thing as well and there tends to be it's like kind of like Myers-Briggs so it's like well you know maybe not so much on the bright side, you tend to need certain things, but then on the positive side, you know, you have these assets, but the negatives aren't really negative. They're just things that everybody needs to be aware of and bear your soul to so that you can all work together better. That was kind of the the tactic that my, my work took as well. This is to get to know each other better so you can understand how you can work with each other. And and I, I'm not going to lie. Some of it was helpful to know like you are a red you require answers right away you require like you're a fast thinker you're this whereas maybe if you're a gold and you need time to think about things in the moment so you can't actually give a response to a question right away don't rush the golds don't rush the golds don't do it 
and I worked with a lot of red people and I was not a red person. So I found it helpful because they understood that when they came up to me and required an immediate answer, it was a challenging thing for me. Interesting. Oh, I have to find this color. I mean, because uh, it looks like Korean and I have never taken this color thing. But I know we had to take like Myers breaks when we were in library school. And I, surprise, I'm going to move on to the next person, but surprise, I think Corinne and I had the same Myers break. What? I want, I want to know now. I want to know now. And we're supposed to be the, the very small group out of the that particular. Anyway, we are, we are the gold. I, I'm just going to say we are the gold. <laughs> All right, Sadie, what kind of color book have you got for us today? Weirdly enough, as I just said, I am not a red person. Uh, the title of my book does have the word red in it. Uh, so the book that I'm going to be talking about is a middle grade book called Red Fox Road. Um, and this came out last year. And it tells the story of Francie. Francie is 13 years old and absolutely loves the outdoors. Um, she loves to go camping. She loves learning about survival techniques. Um, she has a teacher at school that has sort of taken her under her wing and taught her all about how to survive in the forest, um, which Francie just absolutely loves. And so for her birthday, her parents have decided to take her on a trip to the Grand Canyon. And they are driving um, this book. They are from British Columbia. So it is a uh, Canadian author, um, kind of a bit of a local take on it. And they're driving from British Columbia all the way to the Grand Canyon. And our story starts where they are somewhere in Oregon and Francie's dad with his fancy GPS device has determined that if they take a logging road that has kind of appeared on this GPS device, it will shave off a lot of time on their trip. They won't have to do backtracking. They won't have to kind of they'll get to avoid some things. So he has turned down this logging road and uh, they're still currently making their way down this logging road. No idea where they are until there is a loud bang. They kind of go over a, a rut in the road and there's a loud bang and slowly their car stops. So Francie and her parents are now stranded on this logging road. Um, not really knowing what to do, uh, her dad decides that he is going to set off in the direction that they were heading because he's sure he'll take his GPS device. He is sure that the end of the logging road is closer than where they started. So instead of backtracking, he's going to set out on foot and try to find the road, the highway, and bring someone back who can help them. So he sets off leaving Francie and her mom alone in this truck. He says, I'll be back within a few hours, maybe the end of the day, but just hunker down here and I will be back soon. So Francie and her mom stay in the truck, wait, wait, and wait, and wait. So the end of the day comes, her dad doesn't come back. They sleep in the truck. The next morning comes, their dad is still not back. So at some point in this waiting, Francie decides that she is going to go out and find something that maybe they can make a better shelter. Maybe they can find food. She has all these survival skills that she wants to use. Now she is lost in the forest. She needs to survive. So her and her mom start to go explore, but then it starts to rain. They head back to the car. Francie goes to sleep. And when she wakes up the next morning, her mother is gone. There's a note left by her mother basically telling Francie to stay where she is. She is going to go back the way they came and see if she can find the highway that way and get help to bring help back to Francie. Francie is now stranded in the woods completely by herself. Both of her parents have gone. Both of her parents have left her there telling her they're going to be back, but she has no idea when, she has no idea where they have gone. So it is now up to Francie to figure out how she's going to survive in the woods by herself. She does have the truck, which is good. She can stay in there for shelter from any weather, any wild animals, until a storm one night. And Francie has been out exploring and the storm hits and she heads back to the truck to find that a tree has come down 
on top of the truck. She is now without shelter, having to build a shelter by herself. The story kind of continues telling Francie's story of survival, how she finds food, how she finds water, how she builds this structure for herself. Interspersed with this story in the woods, we get flashbacks of something that Francie is dealing with and something that Francie's family is dealing with. Early in the book, it kind of hints at a tragedy that happened that has sort of torn their family apart, has caused Francie and her mom to not have a great relationship. And as the story goes on, you learn a little bit more about the event that caused this rift. And what it has caused is Francie to constantly feel like she has to be making a good impression for her mother. Her mother always compares her to someone in their life. And she's being compared to her sister. And her sister, unfortunately, passed away about a year beforehand. And in her mom's eyes, her sister was very sick, but could do no wrong. And in her mom's eyes, an event that Francie was a part of was potentially the death of her sister. So we get these flashbacks between Francie using these survival skills, showing how capable she is as a, as a young woman using these skills in the wilderness. And then also these feelings of constant doubt that Francie is feeling, this feeling that she's constantly not doing enough. She's not the good daughter. She's not the correct one. She, it eventually comes out in her mind. She feels like her mother thinks that it should have been the other way around and that Francie should not have lived when her sister didn't. So it's a very kind of her against the elements kind of story. There's no real antagonist in the story apart from the woods and the wilderness and um, everything in that way that Francie is up against, as well as these feelings that she's dealing with. It was a fairly, really fast moving story I found, even kind of with those flashbacks of these more traumatic times, the story kept moving a lot. Um, so if you really like adventure stories, if you like survival stories, but maybe with just a little bit extra, I think this would be a really great one. So I, I would highly recommend uh, Red Fox Road by, it's by Francis Greenslate. Thank you, Sadie. As you're telling the story, we were like, no, don't go there. <laughs> right? The choices that these characters are making. You just want to yell at the book, why are you leaving? Yeah, right? Stay there. <laughs> you're leaving your 13-year-old daughter in the woods. What are you doing? <laughs> what not to do when you're, your truck breaks down. So since you're talking about something like a slightly a little scary, a little horror-y. Very good for October. I guess I will continue that trend. Surprise! <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I, I actually, I, this book chat really helps me narrow down to what I should read because I'm so indecisive when it comes to what to read next because there's so many books out there. So it helps whenever like we have a topic then I'm like, okay, yeah, go back to my to be read list. Or this is what I'm going to read. So I got a lot of books on my list that was actually, I end up having color in it. Um, and I even read one with a robot detective, Sadie. It's called Red Dust, a science fiction by a Cuban author. And I was like, oh, you know, that's a Raymond Chandler, but with robots, it's, it's pretty great. But anyway, I thought, you know, it's October. I am not going to pass up the opportunity to talk about a horror book, you know? So I end up picking... Black Met Wheel by Josh Melaman. So this is an offer you may know from maybe not the book himself, but maybe from the Netflix adaptation starring Sandra Bullock called Bird Box. And this is the offer of that. And uh, in true KIF fashion, that is probably not my favorite Josh Melaman book, you know, because it's the most popular one. We all know how, how it works here. Um, but um, his other books are really great. But this one is also really, really excellent. I think he's so good at writing these very atmospheric kind of reads. Like he's really good for that. Anyway, I wouldn't do that if I were you. It's the line that pops into Philip Tonka's mind. He has no context for that. He doesn't know where that line comes from. He doesn't know who said it. He doesn't know where he has heard it. But he keeps thinking this sentence, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Philip Tonka is lying in a hospital bed. He could barely move his head. Other than his head, he can't move any other part of his body. And he is in pain. 
feeling super frustrated. He kind of knows why he's here. Things are coming back to him, but it's super frustrating, feeling so powerless, not being able to move. But even this tiny movement of his head is a miracle. It's astonishing to all the nurses and the doctors in the hospital because they never expected Philip to be able to move again. Philip came to the hospital about six months ago and he has been in a coma since then. And when he came to the hospital, all his bones were broken. Not just an arm or a leg, every single bone in his body was broken. It's as if he was lying on the ground one day and a giant stone slab just like fell on him or something and broke all his bones. Nobody knows what happened to Philip and they're trying to find out. One of the nurses is Nurse Ellen and she has been taking care of Philip for the last six months. And so seeing Philip just even making that slight movement, she was so happy for him. But as we learn more about Philip's life now in the hospital, readers also get treated to the story before he comes to the hospital. We find out that Philip was a war veteran from World War II. And after he came back from the war, he and a couple of the other veterans form a musical group called The Danes. And they have recorded a few hits. And now they even have their own recording studio to help other newer musicians get them started on it. But one day when they were drinking in the bar, they were approached by a general from the US military. And they said to him that they have a job for the Danes. And they're all like, "Uh uh-uh, no, we're musicians now. We are not soldiers. But the general said, yes, I know. And that's why we need you. Because what I need you to do is to locate a sound. We need someone who knows about sound and how sound works. And we have sent in two platoons already and they've all come back, but they weren't able to find this sound in the desert. And I need a group of musicians, $100,000 for each of you, plus money for the band. Two weeks, that's all I ask for you, two weeks to go find this sound in the desert. As the story goes, you learn more about Philip, you learn about his friends and his group, and you learn about this mysterious sound and why the U.S. military is so intent on finding it. Philip was only told that this sound has actually rendered even a nuclear warhead useless. All the guns don't work when they get near this sound, and the people, when they hear it, they will immediately get really, really sick. And so they know this is not a easy task and it potentially could be quite dangerous, but all the other platoons came back home. So it's not at least deadly and it's a hundred thousand dollars. So they figure, okay, well, we'll go look for this sound, but what is this sound? Like most of Josh Mellerman book. And I think a lot of horror, when I think about like how it's different from mysteries, that it always has a mystery in it, but it's not about solving that mystery. It's about the journey of the people that are trying to figure this out. And it's about what you learn about yourself as you go through this horrifying journey into the desert to look for this mystery, deadly sound that can annihilate all weapons. And as you're moving through the book, the chapters get shorter and shorter and the sentences get shorter and shorter because you're just getting into that climax of like, what is this? But do we really know what the sound is? I don't know. I don't know if I know exactly what it is. And I feel like that's the kind of book that appeals to me, may not be for every reader, because I think a lot of readers sometimes, they need a conclusion. They need to know what it is. And so it could be, can be annoying, but what I really enjoy is just that journey, that philosophical journey that you take with Philip and and the Danes and and his friends and trying to figure this out. I'm not quite always understanding what it is, but there's just something really interesting about just having a book that has, you know, it's kind of open up to interpretation. And I do quite like that type of ending. So if that sounds great to you and if you're looking for horror for this month, check out Black Mad Wheel by Josh Melamont. All right. Well, I asked everybody about their favorite color. I'd like to know, what is your favorite color combo? 
Fiona, we can tell her, her face just lit up when you talk about color palettes. I can tell. So why don't we go to Fiona first? What is your favorite color combo in your perfect color palette? Um, I won't say it's like my favorite because I feel like that would take a lot of thought. Um, but one that I, I find safe and makes me happy um, is like gold. Uh, you know, that sort of like... Um, or like mustard that everybody's wearing right now that I love a lot. Um, and then like um, khaki green and then like maroon, like a real uh, fall feel. That's I think I wear like a lot of that and it just feels earthy and pleasant. But I won't say it's my favorite. I just like it. <laughs> favorite for today. The one that you want to talk about today. Well, and then it's fall. So I can see that those are like fairy fall colors. How about you, Liz? Um, probably gray and anything. I mean, I love monochromatic palettes. So like the Smurf look, various shades of blue, grays, you know, a gradient. Um, but yeah, gray and anything, gray and blue particularly. I really like just kind of grounds everything. You know, that kind of in-between neutral. Gray and more grays. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Corrine. This is this is easy. It, it, at the moment, it is uh, pink and kind of like green, like a minty, minty green. I know. I know. And yet, I can see your face, Virginia. You can't escape from me. I know, but there were these like file folders at Ikea that had these colors and it was kind of like cherry blossoms and then a green background. And I was like, I need to have these. And so for whatever reason, it just kind of like feels fresh. Like I'm like sitting under the, ch the cherry blossoms and they're all like floating down at me. Yeah. I, I, you could make that face, Virginia, but you know, I'm right. Well, and, and if Ikea has it, I mean, who am I to question Ikea obviously? If Ikea has it, then it's perfect. Then it's perfect. Yes. So I got that. And then I threw in the gray for Liz, obviously. And now that's my entire room. All right. Sadie, do you have green involved or pink? No pink. Um, actually, very similar to Fiona. I really love maroon. Definitely, especially in the fall and like the kind of khaki-ish like this this color of green I have my mask today like that kind of dark darkish uh, foresty green um and then uh maroon and navy as well I really like together which were our, our my wedding colors um were maroon and navy so I like maroon matched with with most things I love the gold combo but I cannot wear it which makes me sad any yellow on me makes me look kind of green and kind of sick um but orange works so if you match it with orange then the kind of the tones of the orange seem to work for me it's okay fiona will wear all that colors for you we can look at exactly yeah. exactly that's why it's why i'll never be able to have that uh that uniform i can't oh, wear yeah. that yellow sweater i just can't do it <laughs> i just look like i'm sick <laughs> we'll have to yeah just find a complimentary one it'll be like a Multi, yeah. <laughs> black, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of black, Virginia, what is your favorite I'm, combination? I'm going to have to say, okay, this is weird because I don't like blue, but I really enjoy like teal and brown. Teal and brown is what I like. I don't know why. But if I have to pick two other colors other than black and black, then I would be teal and brown. Virginia? Yes. I was really hoping you could tell us how you feel about navy. Oh my god. You have heard that already. I think in the blue episode we've talked about navy before. No, navy is probably the worst blue color. I don't know. I know people love navy, but I just I can't stand navy. I don't know what it is. All right. Well, that's why again, that's why there's so many colors in the world for all of us. So many books in the world for all of us. So Fiona, what have you got today? Okay, I'll try to refocus. Um, so I'm really excited about my book today because it's it's not my usual kind of book. It's very plot driven. And it made me think of Virginia because it has black in the title. And as I was reading it, I was like, I want to recommend this to Sadie. So uh, I chose Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho. Uh, this is my first Zen Cho book, but she is a fabulous writer. The book is about Jess. 
Jess has recently graduated from Ivy Lee College, and she is not where she hoped she would be after that graduation. She has moved back in with her parents who are moving from the States where they have lived, I think, all of Jess's life, and they are moving back to Malaysia. So her family is Chinese Malay, and she has American citizenship. Now, I realized in reading this book that I don't know very much about South Asia. So I have loved learning about it, especially the dialects. It's really neat. Um, but I do apologize if I get something wrong. It's it's new to me. And I'm so grateful to this author uh, for doing this own voice book with, for like such a great chance to, to learn. Because it also has this great element of, I guess, like fantasy and religion. So it would it would have fit really well with our topic a few weeks ago. Jess is moving to Malaysia and she has a lot of secrets, uh, secrets she can't tell her parents. The big one is she has a girlfriend. Her girlfriend is currently in Indonesia and while she hasn't made a complete commitment, I think she's kind of hoping they'll be reunited after she gets her parents settled in Malaysia. She can find a job in Indonesia and they can be together again. Now, this is the number one thing that Jess never wants her parents to know about her. When she starts to hear voices in her head, one of the questions that comes up from the voice is, does your mother know you are a lesbian? Now, they use, I think, a Hokkien Uh, word for that. And I'm not going to say it in case it's really offensive. (laughs) But these voices continue with such intrusive questions in her own head. And it seems to know things about her that no one else knows. And it seems to know things about other things that she doesn't know. So while she's convinced that this is just stress-driven, she starts to wonder where these words that are not in her vocabulary are coming from. All right. I feel like it happens early enough in the book that I can disclose these voices are, in fact, the spirit of Jess's grandmother, her ama, who has recently passed on. And she has a lot of demands. (laughs) She is a spirit who is quite spirited and possibly has the ability to take over Jess's body. Jess is really in a tough spot. You know, it's it's her grandmother. Uh, she doesn't know much about her. She knows that her mom's family has been estranged from her. Her mom doesn't want anything to do with her brother or didn't want anything to do with her mom before she passed on. So Jess is cautious, but also curious. What is it that her mom didn't want her to know? That her mom didn't want her to know. Um, Well, this spirit implores her to visit a temple in Malaysia, and that is when a lot of things go down. Not only is Jess hearing the voice of her ma, she is also able to see gods and spirits. Like I said, it's really plot-driven. Jess is a strong character. She knows what she wants, but she's very dependent, and that also means being very isolated. She doesn't have a lot of friends. She doesn't have people to talk to. However, she does eventually meet Sheng, who is the young son of one of the Forbes' fifth richest man in the world or possibly Malaysia. However, her ama is like, don't trust that guy. He's a gangster. So is she going to trust Sheng, who seems like a really decent guy. She's the first person that he's that she's talked to who understands, you know, when she talks about Netflix and all these like, you know, millennial things that her parents just don't get. And he also is a self-guided businessman who owns an awesome hipster cafe that she finds uh, unfortunately very comforting. What I love is that uh, Schering seems to maybe have a thing for Jess, but Jess is queer and is not interested in him in that way. So I I feel like another book might have a a predictability of a will they, won't they? uh, And it's sort of just like, will they, won't they be friends? Because maybe their families are at war. 
yeah. So it is, uh, it's just so fresh and, and fun. And I really love a book that doesn't dumb itself down for its readers. Uh, so there is so much cool folklore in there, gods. So the Blackwater Sister, as the book is named after, is a terrifying god that Jess finds herself confronted by. Uh, she wants to protect the land that is being developed where her shrine is. And Jess somehow finds herself in the middle of this possessed fight, her grandmother fighting gods with her own hands. Super cool. If you're Sadie, <laughs> you should totally <laughs> read it. If you're not Sadie, you should also try it out. Um, that is Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho. Just added to my to read list. Just put it on there. Thank you, Fiona. You have to now. <laughs> right? Fiona did this whole thing for you. <laughs> I know. I'm going to be really, really upset. I'm going to be very upset if for some reason I don't like it, though. <laughs> Just don't don't put it on the Goodreads. Just don't, don't start. Don't rate it. And no one would know. <laughs> no one will know when I'm reading it. <laughs> Well, speaking of, we do have an episode coming up. I think it's like we have to read a book that was recommended on the show by one of the book friends. So that could be that. No pressure, though. <laughs> read what you want. <laughs> all the pressure, Fiona. All the pressure. <laughs> <sighs> all right. Uh, last but not least, Miss Corrine, what have you got? Well, I'm actually going to start with a musical interlude to kind of like set my scene. So it's 1948. We're in Los Angeles, city of angels, city of sin. We zoom into the fifth ward, the traditionally black part of LA. And there, Nursing a drink, we see Easy Rollins. He is a Black World War II veteran, and he has just been laid off. And he knows, oh, he knows, he's got that mortgage due at the end of the week. No job to pay the bank. As he's soothing his sorrows at Joppy's Bar, an old friend from Houston, trouble walks in. Trouble in the form of a smooth, slick looking white man striding into the bar like he owns the place, walks right up to Easy Rollins and says, I've got a job for you. Now, Easy knows that this is trouble. This man has trouble written all over him. But what can you, what can you do? Mortgage is due. He's got no job. And despite knowing that he's in for a world of trouble, takes the money, and starts his first case. This is the first book in the Easy Rollins detective series by Titan King legend Walter Mosley. This is the very first book in a very, very celebrated series, very much in the vein of uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Elmore Leonard. It is a hard-boiled detective story, but told in a fresh new way. Walter Mosley is writing about the Black experiences in the 1940s, showing you a side of L.A. that you probably have never seen before. It is... Oh, Ezekiel Easy Rollins has been through the war and you kind of get that experience of black soldiers during the segregated war of World War II. He, he kind of finds himself at ends when he loses his job for standing up to his boss by refusing to work overtime. And he finds himself embroiled in with DeWitt Allwright, who has connections all over the town and who does favors for friends. And DeWitt has a friend who would like to find a particular woman, a white woman named Daphne Monet. Now, Daphne is known to frequent the black jazz bars of the Fifth Ward, and unfortunately, DeWitt would not be welcome in such establishments. But he has heard through the bar's owner, Joppy, that um, 
easy can be trusted. Easy can get the job done. And what's more important is that Easy is desperate for money at this point. So, seeing no option, he takes the picture of this blonde bombshell and heads off to John's place, a speakeasy, a jazz bar, where he's got a lot of friends. Doesn't think much of this job. He sidles up to one of his good friends, Dupree, with his girl, Coretta, and starts asking a couple of subtle questions as to whether anyone had seen a white woman around recently. Coretta, Dupree's girl, kind of gives him a side-eye glance. Maybe she knows a little something, but she's going to need a drink to loosen that tongue. They start drinking all night long and eventually stumbling home to Dupree's apartment. With Dupree asleep in the next bedroom, Coretta and Easy start to talk. Hmm. And Coretta reveals that, yes, she knows Daphne. She knows where Daphne is. And with that information, Easy conveys that back to DeWitt and he considers it a job done. He takes the $100, goes on his merry way, only later to learn that Coretta is dead and he is the primary suspect. This is a story that is very hard boiled. It is in the the beautiful tradition of like LA confidential about like the rotten core of, of like big cities of LA where it's the cops and the mayor's office and the banks making all the decisions. But Walter Mosley writes that so wonderfully and he really does give you that that glimpse into the Black American experience in the 1940s, especially for those veterans who came home from the war and were kind of struggling with where their place was in society. It's dark. It's a noir. It's a noir. It's not a happy book. It's not a happy book. Bad things happen to people. Bad things happen to people. But honestly, I could not stop reading it. I read it in one sitting because it was so compelling. Um, and it was so, so just like, it read just like a movie. And in fact, this book has been adapted into a film starring Denzel Washington, which I am going to absolutely go and check out because it seems amazing and would make such, makes a great series. Obviously, this is the 30th anniversary edition of the book. It has been in print for a long time. There are lots of books in the series and I think I'm going to pick them up because I did pick up this one because I did Google the word blue in our library catalog. And this is what came up first. Uh, but I think I'm actually going to start doing the rest of the series because it was that good. And, and I love a story of like person versus the rotten establishment. So yeah, that is my choice. Devil in a Blue Dress by Walter Mosley. Thank you, Miss Corrine. It is indeed a giant, literary giant. If you read mystery, that is definitely someone you should check out. All right. Well, thank you everyone for picking a color book. I uh, love the variety today. Uh, any last words about colors that you want to share with the world? Our color palette expert, Fiona, or Liz, who now knows all about us because she knows what color we have chosen. Just enjoy the gray because <laughs> we're in for eight months of it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the gray. Like Liz said, gray goes with everything. Yeah, you just got to find the right compliment. And appreciate and appreciate the colors of the leaves right now. There might be gray, but there's also beautiful reds and oranges and yellows. True optimist. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm -hmm.